All right, good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me. We can hear you. Awesome. Give me one second. I'll turn the volume off on this computer. All right, great. Can everybody see the slides? Yep, we can see it. Oh. All right, all right, welcome back. So today we're gonna do some fun stuff. We're gonna jump uh, into Unity, kind of kind of hopscotch ahead a bit. We're gonna keep going back and forth with the, the Python stuff, but I think it'd be a great opportunity for you guys to get a kind of visual of what we're gonna be getting towards and to get excited to start thinking about your project and what you wanna start modeling. And so before I kind of want to just show a few slides about this idea of reinforcement learning to kind of remind yourself, you know, why we're excited about this, why we think this is a big deal. And, you know, maybe we want to start with, with this idea of where do rewards actually come from. And this is really the fun part because we get to look at the brain anatomy and we get to figure out, you know, how actual organisms build their reward systems. And we get to some really interesting, you know, philosophical questions I think are kind of fun when we first got the little robot rover cars. We would joke about, you know, do you reward them with batteries? Do you give them more RAM, right? Do you give them, you know, do they get 10 minutes of internet access? You know, what does it mean to reward a software agent? I think it's really kind of at the heart of what we're gonna be doing. And so we'll build mathematical models. We have nice games. We're gonna use things like the um, breakout and, and simple games that we can build as concrete worlds that have known feedbacks, right? They have obvious reward structures and we can leverage that to test our ideas about how to build a learning machine. I like this comment, um, you know, as humans, we are accustomed to operating with, with rewards that are so sparse, we only experience them once or twice in a lifetime, if at all, if at all. right? So, you know, later in your career, you're gonna go out and you guys are all gonna go out and get major amazing companies building robots and all this great stuff. And that'll be your big reward for sitting through these lectures, right? So the reward is gonna, is gonna come some much time later and your brain has to figure out that what you're doing now has, has great value. My, my favorite example of reward is just like eating, right? You know, this, this, you got the uh, cheetah over here trying to chase these things. Um, you know, imagine you just got something like you're trying to just bring, imagine you already have the food, you're trying to bring it to your face. Like from a robot's point of view, all this movement with your hands have nothing to do with eating. It, how does it know? And how do you learn from the very beginning this set of actions is actually going to do what it is that you want to do? So why, why is this a big deal now? Well, there's just been an explosion, an explosion of progress. It's really changing the world where people are taking these things serious. These ideas, like, like the rest that we've been talking about, they've been around for more than 100 years. But now I call them industrial strength. They can really do some, some awesome stuff. So we're going to look at this Atari emulator, which is fun. We're working on upstairs, getting that set up at a really high speed. We've got some great models that can, that can learn to play Pong. You see in the middle there, we've got the real world robots. So, you know, Matt's got all these awesome robots. We've got the robot dog. These things have to learn to interact with us. And so how do we teach them, right? We can't quite write the programs here. What we see is a Google lab where they want to do um, how to do manipulation with robot arms. So they actually make baskets of toys and put a little camera on the arm. And this thing sort of goes to preschool. It's sort of robot preschool. And it just kind of plays in the, to in the bucket of toys for end on end, just like you did when you were three years old. And then very famously, we have one of the most difficult um, you know, intellectual challenges on the planet is Go game. In the West, it's not as common, but in, in, in the East, this is a really big deal. It's like being a golf champion or something. People spend their entire life to become at the top of this game. And the world champion uh, was beat by this algorithm and people were shocked. They expected that to take another 10 years before that had happened. Uh, and you can see that's almost five years ago now. And so these, these ideas have been around for a long time. We have this classic reinforcement kind of ideas. But now we're going to be able to combine them with the deep learning. So we have these new technologies. We have a lot of data we can train it with. We have these simulations. That's really what's so exciting that we're going to get to is how we can simulate this data. And then we have the memory capacity in our computer to bring in a whole image. When we, if we go back to a few decades, the computer did not have enough RAM, did not have enough memory to load in a full photograph. You could load in a few pixels at a time. This is one of the reasons why the development of these cellular automata models took off at the time, because 
That's all the computer could handle is one pixel and its nearest neighbors. Now we have the ability to load in high resolution images and we're gonna go through these architectures of how we run convolution operations to get out a category. And so it's this combination of deep learning, which really came from labeling photographs. You know, like Facebook wants to do the face recognition. These uh, labeling, visual label architectures, we're gonna be able to use as front end visual systems for our reinforcement learning. And so we can do all kinds of stuff. We can teach these things to walk. And it's all about, you know, uh, people play backgammon. This is really interesting. You know, this was a really big deal. Backgammon was actually beat by computers in like 1994. They beat the world champion in backgammon. And so it's interesting that for some reason that just didn't get the world's attention like this other stuff did. But in general, we're gonna be interested in this loop, right? We're gonna look at this loop over and over again where this is perception action loop. We're gonna observe something about the environment. We might get a reward. And then we're gonna take some step in the environment. So the old way to do these things, we have sort of a standard way and then a deep learning way. So the standard way was we would, as uh, vision engineers, as signal processors, as mathematicians, we would sort of think very carefully and very hard about how to process this. And so this stands for histogram of oriented gradients and such, and support vector machines. And so you would have all of these, you know, sort of hand-coded tuned algorithms. And the breakthrough was to say, no, let's set up more like the visual nervous system. Let's set up a layers of learnable convolutional filters. And then when we learn these filters, we do what's called end to end. So we take all the way, to, this, is, this is supposed to represent the CCD array of your camera itself. So all the way from the raw sensor data to the actual category without deciding along the middle what those representations should be. Here, the humans are deciding what the intermediate representations look like and are gonna, are gonna be. Here, we just let the data itself say, this is what we start with. This is what we know we want change this in the middle until this is the case. And so this exact same thing happened in reinforcement learning. And so with the backgammon, what they would get the game experts and they would say, well, you, what you want to do is you want to count all the pieces on one side and then subtract the pieces on the other side and that would be a feature. And then you'd, you'd, you'd come up with these sort of recipes kind of thing, right? You can imagine in chess, if you, if you have your queen still on the board, that's a certain point. If you have all your pawns, a certain number of points. If you have both the rooks, it's a certain number of points and so on. And these are sort of handcrafted features about how strong is the current uh, chessboard that you're looking at. What was the big breakthrough with this reinforcement was to do the exact same thing with the neural networks for vision and just do this end to end. Where we just give it a reward structure and it has to build its features and figure out what those features are going to look like. Let me plug in this laptop. Give me one second to plug in this laptop for, for later. Okay, so this is our perception action loop. We have a virtual eyeball. We're gonna have a virtual retina that we're gonna build in, in Unity. We're gonna bring that through our, our visual nervous system. Don't worry about you know the details of this. We're gonna go through and code this by hand in Python. From there, that's gonna essentially get this other representation. There's a tiger. And then we're gonna want some other policy network that given this, you know, given this input now of Tiger, which is sort of like a very high level representation rather than the raw pixel data, we can send that through a policy network and your policy network should say something like run away. And now we have this action perception loop and we will, can do things like you know, virtual evolution and evolve, you know, pretend like there's a genotype and a phenotype that, that determines these connections, or we can learn these in the lifetime of the organism. So we can think of all learning as really operating, operating on either one of two time scales. Either you're learning in sort of a genetic evolutionary time scale about the behavior or you're learning on the individual uh, like in the, during the lifetime of the organism itself. And that'll give us this perception feedback loop. And so this is pretty neat. So here we have sort of broken up this idea of thinking of model these really as visual cortex and motor cortex. Then we have a certain set of processing that's gonna take in the data and break it down into these different representations to try to understand what it sees. And then another module that's gonna take in that and try to break that down and decide, well, what do I do with that? How do I execute a motor command? And that's this sensory motor loop. So we can teach robots to walk. You know, we're gonna look at uh, these different states. We're gonna be in general interested in vision as our state. That's gonna be the primary focus for us. 
But in general, we can have lots of different things as input. You can have accelerometers, you could have microphones, you could have tilt sensors, you could have anything you want, LIDAR, uh, pressure switches. You could have all kinds of states going in as abstract inputs, and you could think of them as like random pixels or something, sort of like an image. We can always make an image out of stuff, even if it's not a camera. And then we send that through our policy, and we can evolve that policy and learn that policy, do the same kind of thing for the robot dog. So in general, we want to think about what do we put into this agent such that we can learn this environment. So our environment is going to be Unity. So we're going to look today. I'll, we'll, we'll kind of jump in that a bit. And then, and then Rachel's going to show us some, some great stuff that she's working on in that space to give you kind of an overview of, of how this is how this, this research works. So here we have the simple Pong. We're getting this, uh, we have this set up upstairs already. We're getting it set up on the emulator so it can run really fast. We're looking at a program that can run this at like just like a dizzying speed. And then we can do a lot of experiments on it. So when we think about this, this picture, you know, we don't, we see this Pong layout. We already bring a lot to the table. You know, you're one of these paddles. You know that this thing, you already know what table tennis is and all that. Even the smallest kid's going to have some idea of what they know. It's a game, for example. They know there's an adversary. These programs don't know anything about that. They're just sort of mathematical objects. And so we have to somehow from all of the pixel data, we have to figure out what kind of mathematical object we're going to use these networks which are really just multiplications. And so we're going to multiply and weight these pixels by something such that we get an output, which is kind of like a knee jerk reaction. It's like when the doctor, when they hit your knee and then you kick, this is going to be the kick. And you want to know, you know, what does this do? Which way does it make you kick? And so uh, probably on Thursday and next week, we're going to go into the Python and look at how we actually do the math of that. Uh, as we were joking before, you know, one way to do this is just to do a random walk. But the problem is, is it takes a really, really long time. Like, evolutionary, you know, ep eons kind of thing. If you have a few billion years, you can do this. You can just wait and you will get emergent life. Although I think there's some still interesting things missing from that puzzle. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to build environments in Unity that can do stuff. So we want you to think about, you know, what you want to build. We're going to focus on things like mice and Drosophila and all that, but, but get creative. We can we can think of, you know, think of a different animal, maybe a fish, or I saw somebody made a mud skipper, which was really cool, and it kind of learned to get up on the land. I thought that was awesome. You know, you could make like a clam that learns to open and close during the tides or something like that. It would be really cool. And, and even clams have uh, very simple optical sensors as well. We can run mazes. We have a, a really nice road course generator that'll just kind of generate endless environments. And then we can like sort of test the robustness of these policies. We can add noise to them. We can sort of add damage to them. One of the amazing things about, you know, organisms and people is that they can, we can we're sort of fail soft. We can take a lot of damage and, and, and still kind of fly around and, and, you know, do stuff. And so that's really neat. So we can test the robustness of our little critters and to see how well they can fly under different conditions, right? Make them a little heavier. Do they still know how to fly, for example? Okay, so that's basically the same thing. We're going to look at this vision-based. So we're going to take in the image. We're going to decide what button to press. This is what you do when you're a little kid. If you have any really younger siblings or nieces or nephews or something that are maybe like under three or four, you can just hand them a controller, and they will have a lot of fun just playing with their older their siblings and stuff because they just you know they're getting reinforcement from the social activity. They they don't even quite have the 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 perception action loop in their brain yet to realize that they're causing the buttons but they'll have a lot of fun. And then at about four, they say, hey, wait a minute. I'm not actually playing. Probably even way before four, but you know what I mean. You can try this later. Okay, so we're gonna look at this value function, this idea of, of state, of sort of where you are in the world, and then how valuable is it to be in that state? Some situations are really good to be in, right? I think this is a really great state. We're right in the middle of a complex systems lecture. I mean, this doesn't get any better than that for me. So uh, there's a lot of value in this state. You can imagine there's a dangerous state where you sort of got like one arm hanging off a cliff or something. And it's like, that's a very, the value of that state is very negative. It's not a very good position to be in. And then we have this idea of action value where we, we take that a little farther and we say, well, what's the utility of being in this state and doing this action? And so, um, you know, I like to, to make, you can make up a funny state. Like you're, you're, um, you're at a casino and you have $200 and, um, you know, and you're drinking an orange soda or something silly, right? That you could imagine just, you know, making up some random, you know, condition that you're, that you're doing and that's the state you're in. And one thing you could do is you could pour your orange soda into the casino machine. Well, they're going to kick you out. So that's not a good action to do. 
you could put all of your money onto red or whatever. Well, that's probably not a good action to do either. You could go to the buffet and get a sandwich. If you're hungry, that's probably a good action. And it's a good, you know, food's cheap at the casino because they want you to spend more money. So, you know, so you can build out this, you know, the best thing to do is probably leave the casino, right? That's probably the, the best, the best action you could do because then you'll have the most of your money. So you can imagine maybe it'd be kind of fun to simulate an actual casino and see if your agent just kind of learns to go home. That would be really fun. Okay, so we're going to do this in a Q table. We'll, we'll uh, look at this Q table next time and kind of do this by hand. We're going to look at this, this way of kind of discounting um, this idea of uh, credit assignment. So we were talking about the sandwich. I go through all of these weird actions with wrists and elbows and all this kind of stuff. But there's no reward. I haven't got the sandwich yet. So how is it that when you finally you know, take the bite of sandwich or later are nourished by the sandwich and all these kind of come, how do you then later go back and learn, okay, grabbing sandwiches and bringing them to my face is a good action, right? And it sounds like an extreme example, but this is, we have to learn all of these things. Okay, so we're going to go through these equations. We'll skip that for right now. So we're going to look at these environments. Unity has all this uh, great, has this great package that just came out relatively recently. And um, it moves all the time. Unfortunately, they update it like every couple of weeks. It almost makes it like a moving target to try to learn it. And they've created this for uh, video game developers. And the idea is you're going to create a video game like uh, Grand Theft Auto. And in that game, you steal a car and you have the police chase you. And so you want the police to be really good at chasing you, for example, right? If they're not good at chasing you, the game's no fun. And so what you can do is you can set up a cops and robbers scenario and train in, with artificial intelligence to get your uh, cop to chase the robber. And so that's why they've developed this tool. What we're doing is we're bootstrapping that and sort of using it for our own science research and say, we don't want to make better video games. And you know, what they've done is traditionally with the, um, the video games, they use these heuristics. So kind of like we were saying before, you just make up rules. And so you say, well, how far away are you from the bad guy? And you know, you make the car go a certain speed or something like this. You sort of have these heuristics about to get it to do it. The way the video games do not work is that the, the video game cop does not have an eyeball and he's not actually looking at the cars and he's not actually driving, right? The, video, the, the AI in every video game kind of knows the state of the video game. If they wanted to, they could, you know, shoot you with the next bullet, but they have a, a random number generator to make it fun and all that kind of stuff. And so that's how these games kind of work. We're, so we're going to do it in a slight, in a very different way. We're going to take in this retina and really treat it like a virtual agent, right? So this is what's different from the, the rest of this community that's doing, it's doing great work. I encourage you to look into this and run these examples. But almost, but most of these are not going to be using vision. So we're going to start with these, I call them whiskers. So Rachel's going to tell you more about that. And it is fantastic because it allows you to kind of learn these models really fast because it's a low dimensional input. And we'll explain more what that means later. But we're going to, we're ultimately, we're going to be building up to the vision input. And so that's what I want you to kind of think about is sort of how to do the vision. But we can make them do interesting things. Like this one has legs. So you could have, you can make these eyeballs on that spider active. And now you can make it learn to walk. And in the beginning, it just sort of flaps its legs, but then it actually learns to walk. So this is a really fun one where you have a penguin and the penguin is going to have to learn to go out and collect these fish and then bring them back to the baby penguin here. And so what we do is we can set up where the where they start. We can sort of build this like a little video game and then we can set up the art and all, which is kind of fun. We'll just do things with simple blocks and stuff to start. But I think it's good to kind of bring in a visual metaphor for these. Your brain already knows a lot about penguins and can think. So these are what I call whiskers. It's what um, they call it. Is what do they call it? Ray tracing. What do they call it? Ray, ray, ray casting. Ray yeah, ray casting. Yeah, yeah. So they call this ray casting, and the idea is you set up these sort of virtual lines, and what they will do is you set them out at an angle, so you can go sort of straight out your nose, you can go out to the sides. I, that's why I call them whiskers. And then what they'll do is they'll feed back to the agent anytime anything along that line hits the thing you're looking for. So you can set up tags, and you can say if there's a fish that touches this whisker, let me know, and let me know how far away it is. So I think it's a good model of whiskers, and I think they don't they don't think of it that way. So I think there's some good papers on that. We sort of, you know we build like a barrel cortex and look at whisking behaviors and stuff like that. Um, but this allows you to learn very quickly. But what we're going to do is we're going to put in this virtual retina and kind of bring in the, the vision for that. So let me just jump ahead here. This is really what we want to try to get towards is this. Um, you know, I, I would love to have a paper that's almost confusing whether or not we're talking about real animals and neuroscience or if we're talking about our simulated agents. I think that would be really cool. So here we have a couple of uh, tea mazes and sort of a matching test. And in the middle here, we have a water maze. And so, uh, you know, in a lot of labs at FAU, what they'll do is they'll put a mouse here and it's sort of like milky water. And this is a little platform that they can stand on to get a break from swimming, but it's just below the surface of the water. So they don't know where they can't, they can't see it. 
And so they have to remember where it is and they have to lose, use clues from around the environment and all. And so the idea is, you know, can we simulate or recreate these, these, these classic experiments in these virtual environments and see if we make a little virtual mouse, can it do things like a water maze and a tea maze? And then can we get those experiments um, and, and compare them to what we know from the animal data? Okay, so there's a lot of, you know, really fun things that we can also do with this in terms of questions about curiosity and, and nostalgia and, and um, boredom and all these other kind of more cognitive side of things. And so we have that this breakout on the left is really easy, but this other problem, this it's called Montezuma's Revenge, and it's um, it's also um, an Atari game. It's relatively simple, but it has these sort of multi-step things. It's like a Zelda kind of game. You have to get the key, but to get the key, you have to kill the, the spider and, and so on. And so you have to do this these multi-step process. It's not just like a knee-jerk reaction. You have to think, you have to deliberate, and you have to plan. The agents that we have now that do reinforcement learning, they're terrible at these kinds of models. And so I think that's why we need more like the Andrew Coward architecture, something more like a recommendation system that will allow us to kind of dream ahead a bit, reflect on where we've been and, and think a little more interesting. So this idea of exploration and exploitation, you're very familiar with, right? If you want to, you, you go to a new restaurant or you go to this, you go to the, try somewhere new, you go to the favorite one. Uh, for ads, they want to say, do you, do you show the ad that always gets clicked on or do you try to show an ad that might be the next big ad that gets clicked on? Right? Do you search for gold in the spot where you found gold last time, or do you try to go somewhere else? And in, in general, life is, you know, cognitive agents are really torn constantly between those two decisions. Okay, we also want to think about like rewards that aren't really there. You know, we said before that it might be years before you get some reward from, you know, maybe like a, a great career in robotics or something. But you're getting other rewards right now in terms of com your compression engine and your understanding of reality. And, and you're thinking of science and you're hopefully integrating other things you've learned in different places. And you think, well, I've never really thought of video games that way. And there's math in here and that's really cool. And so I hopefully there's some, some fun auxiliary rewards along the way. So we want to think of how do agents do that? How do kids just have fun? I mean, it, it's just, it's really awesome if you think about it, right? You go over, you know, the kids just like, they just like squeal and run around. You know, I taught a high school class over here and there's a middle school next to it. And you could just like at, at the playground or whatever, just coming in and out, you know, they just like, pop and squeal and they're making all these noises and you know they're just having all this commotion of fun and it's completely undirected it's completely unsupervised there's no official reward structure telling the kids you know halfway through recess be like you're having fun now right and so somehow they just sort of create their own fun and we have to think about like what does that mean for agents um so we have this reinforcement learning where we can do this online where it's living in the world we can also do this in a different way where we can have just sort of replay memory where we can sample the environment and then dream about it later and learn that way Disconnect. Let me just reconnect this web version. Okay, so now I want to jump over and, and show you some Unity stuff. So we're just going to look at some of the basics. There's a tool that I really like that just, it was a third party and it just got merged with uh, Unity and it's called Bolt. And this is a, is a visual scripting language. I think this is really cool because it gives you an idea of what you can do and it allows you to kind of think, um, you know, spatially and visually about these kinds of problems. And I think even if you are, are very strong with the C Sharper, and I would encourage you to learn the, the C co the code, which is, we're not going to need too much of that in this course, but I would encourage you if you want to go out and, you know, do this kind of stuff, you can make really interesting things. Give me one second. Um, this other link seemed to disconnect. So what we're going to do is we're going to build these sort of graph structures where we're going to be able to have these little nodes and then we connect them on this it's sort of a flow control paradigm for computing. And when one thing happens, it's going to then activate this sort of little green arrow and it'll send the control over to another node and then that node will execute that action. So give me a second. Looks like we're having some trouble with WebEx on the laptop here. Disconnected. You should want to come take a look. It's just loading. Is the internet still connected on that one? See if it see if it went to this different, different Wi-Fi or something. Yeah, it's the internet's connected. Okay, so while that's going, so what we're gonna do is to get you started, let's exit from here. So first we're just gonna download Unity. So if we just uh 
search for it here, we'll find Unity, and then we'll have our download. I actually just have the download button right here. So we can just click download right here. And uh, Unity is free. If you're not making any money as a student, it's just completely free. And so we're gonna download this thing called Unity Hub. That's gonna launch here. It runs on Windows, Mac, Linux, works really well on all three. You'll be able to create environments for all of those. You'll be able to create web um, um, what's it called? Uh, WebGL environments. You'll be able to sort of make interactive websites with this. It's a very powerful environment. You can make like GUIs, like graphical user interfaces. Okay. Is it connected now? Yeah. No, what does it say? Uh, it's connected to the wrong Wi-Fi network. Also, I thought you'd like this error message. The prime is not oh, that's really cool. It says our Diffie Hellman prime set by the server is not acceptable. Okay, we'll get to that in a second. I'll just restart this one while, while we're on the other one and hopefully that'll come back in a second. Okay, so we're gonna run Unity Hub now that that's downloaded. Okay, so we have to log in. So we're gonna do this uh, manual activation. So we have to first, you're first you're gonna create a Unity account so go over to the Unity website and you can log in and create an account here. And so if you, you create a Unity ID and this will allow you to get things from the store. Um, and they have tons of free assets. You can kind of build your own, your own library. I'll just log into mine here. Yeah. Oh yeah, here we go. Thank you. Okay, then I'm going to activate a license. I'm going to do Unity Personal. Uh, I'm going to say that the earns less. We're not making any money off of this. Okay. Now I exit preferences. Now I can do a new project. I'm going to... Oh, yeah, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to go down and installs, and it's going to say we don't have any Unity versions yet. So we're going to add a new version of Unity. We're going to click add. Should we do 19 or 20, you think? Yeah, let's just do 19. That's the recommended. What's that? Okay, so then we can add um, a couple of like uh, buttons here, depending on what kind of program you want to make. And so, um, yeah, like for example, WebGL is a really good one to check because then you can make websites right away. And then in general, you want to make things for like Linux, we can add that. So we'll just turn that off for right now so it goes a little faster. We'll read the are chart. You, are you going to try to do it into the Colab? What do you mean? If you're going to try to upload it to the Colab, you might want to. Oh, I know. I'm just trying to do a demo on this for right now so we can show. Yeah, so in general, we might want to add more of those like the Linux installs. So you can filter from that. Yeah, yeah, I got that running. But that's what we want to kind of, yeah, so Misha's saying we can, we can build our environments and then upload them to Colab and actually run, run them in the cloud. So that's really awesome. Okay, so it looks like it's still, this thing is still unhappy with the Wi-Fi. I forgot, I don't know if you remember what the slide for it. Um, we, we had this set up like 20 minutes early. Yeah, yeah you want to see if we can get onto just a different network? It seems like it has a problem with the internet for some reason. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so it's almost done installing here. Okay, so in the meanwhile, while that's while that's finishing up installing, I want to show you the Unity Asset Store, and I think this is really cool. So let me just go back to Unity.com. Let me uh, log. I'm gonna log in here.
Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, yeah. So if we just go to assetstore.unity.com, this is really fun. They have a lot of free stuff. You don't have to buy anything. So what you do is you, uh, they've always got sales and promotions and fun stuff. If you do see something that you feel like you need for your project and it's not, and it's reasonable, let us know. We, we could probably uh, figure out how to get it. But if you go to like top free and stuff, you can find some really great things and, and look around. Um, we're going to grab this one here called Bolt, but, but definitely go through and browse this. It's super fun and you'll, you'll get some great ideas about what kind of projects you can do. We're going to click this one right here called Bolt. You can just search for Bolt too, just up there, search for Bolt. And now we're going to choose Open in Unity. Before I do that, let me tab back over. Looks like it's, it's just finishing up the install. Let's let it finish that. Okay, now can you guys see the other screen now? No, we only see you. Okay, give it one second. It says it's connecting. Um, select window or screen, entire screen, allow. There it is. Okay, so now we can see this other screen. Do you guys see this purple cat? Yeah, you can see that. Yep. Okay, so I'm, I'm on the Linux version now. I'm going to tab over to that. I'm going to open up uh, Unity on this computer. Do we have to have Linux to use Unity? No, no, you don't. So that's why on the other one, we we're just showing the Windows install. You can put it on Mac. Um, you can put it on all three. Oh, yeah. Let me full screen this. Can you go back to the install uh, page? Because I was just, like making an account the whole time you were doing that. Um, yeah. Let me go back one second. Okay, yeah, no problem. Let me, let me, let me slow down. Just please slow me down. Okay, let me go back to that. Okay, yeah, so we were at this Unity. So I just Googled uh, Asset Unity. And it'll take us to the Unity Asset Store. So if you need a minute to, to make an account, go ahead and make an account. And then this is, this, this, uh, this is pretty fun. I don't know, I just like looking through this stuff because there's so many, so many cool things here. And, and you can do a search. So you just search for like, um, say we want like a mouse. Okay, so here we can find a mouse and then we can look around. Uh, I got this one because it was really cool. It was about 20 bucks. But what you can do is you go over here for pricing and then you can put free assets and you can see are there, what, you know, what they have for free. It looks like these might be like that kind of like cursor mouse. Let's put in like, um, let's put in forest. So if I put in forest, a lot of this stuff will be in 2D. We're going to want 3D so we can check the 3D box. And then... Um, yeah, so some of these are like kind of, you know, professional things. Like here's like a full animated animal pack. That's like 120 bucks. That's pretty, that's a pretty expensive. But then they have a lot that are, that are free. And, you know, if there's a thing, you know, that's a certain kind of thing we can put in like a, a local internal grant and you say, okay, well, you know, there's tech fees and stuff like that that we can put in. And again, if there's one that you really want, let us know. Um, we've got a lot already purchased in the lab. So let us know. Here's some toadstools. Here's some trees. You know, here's like an island. You know, so like that island would be kind of cool. You could just like put all your animals on there. You could have fish swim around the island and try to, you know. All right, so that would be a super cool environment to try to simulate some stuff on. And so then we can just click open in Unity. Let's try that. Let's see if our install is done. Oh, it looks like it's still installing here. Okay, so while that one's still, while that one's still installing, let me switch back over to the other system. Okay, so I've opened up Unity Hub here. So after the, after the install's done, so let me show you. So we've done the install. You should have just one. I put both versions on here. And um, once you've got the installs done, then what you do is you go up to the Projects tab, and we can choose New Project. And so we can choose 19 or 20. We'll choose 19. It wants a name for this project. So we can give it a project name. We're going to choose 3D to so make sure the 3D box is selected. It should be by default. And then we'll give this a name. No, I said the wrong thing. I'm sorry. We want to go up top and log in. So give me one second and I'll show you. Let me go back to this one. The, 
question was about the manual activation in the Unity Hub. There is a little, it was like a little person thing and you can click up here in the upper right and you can log in with your new account up there. Thank you, Rachel. Okay, so that's still, that's just finishing up. Post on the discussion board in Canvas. Thank you, Misha. So if you have any uh, trouble, please post into the chat and you can, we'll get some help. Okay, so now we're back on this screen. We've got our Unity Hub. I just, we opened up our Unity Hub. I made a new project. I now have it in my list. So when I click on that, that'll open up my project. So I'm going to turn on the default layout window real quick so you can see what it looks like when you start. Is that full screen enough? No, no, please. Tell me, show me what to do. Ah. Which? Ah, it's view. There we go. Okay, great. Okay. So now we're in, this is our Unity environment. Don't be intimidated. There's a lot of buttons. Uh, go through it and click them all later so you can have some fun, you know, learning this stuff. There's a lot of really great videos that, that I'll post that you guys can go through to learn this. We're not going to use every feature and every bell and whistle, so don't, so don't stress. We're not going to need to do that. We're going to be able to use this as, a, as a, an environment we can bring in our world and do some stuff. Just keep waiting everybody to get it set up here a second. Okay, so we've got our environment. Let's start up here with our, our menus. We're gonna go up to our game object menu and we're gonna see 3D object and we're gonna choose plane. And so when we click that, that created a new object in our world and it's just sitting there. So what's really cool about this is we get to kind of render this environment in real time. I'm gonna right click and I can kind of move around I'll have to bring in the other mouse later because you definitely want to use a mouse for these programs to, to use the wheel in and out. So the things to notice so far in this environment, we've just put in a plane and we have two other things in our scene. Let's see if I can make this bigger. We have our main camera and we have our directional light. All right, so let's see if I delete the directional light, our lighting went away and our, our, our plane is, is, is uh, dark now. So let's do undo delete game object. Now our light is back. We can move that light around we have these three different colored uh, arrows that determine which direction we're going to move. We're using the move tool. So we have a grab tool, a move tool, rotate, and scale. So we'll use the, the move tool. And then if we grab the green arrow, we'll move along the green axis, the red axis, and the blue axis. And it'll sort of highlight which one it'll go. Um, it'll, it'll sort of let you know which one you're hovering over at any one time. So you can move it in that direction. We have our camera there. If I click on the camera, we get a preview of what that camera is going to see. That's going to be the render of the world. I can make the camera say, well, I want the camera to look at where I'm seeing right now. So I can pick a new view. I can select the camera. I can do game object. And then I'll align with view. And now the camera is in the frame and this is the camera will be set. So you're basically creating a theater. This is your little stage. You're the director. You get to put the camera wherever you want. You get to put the lighting wherever you want. You get to make whatever you want. So let's go and we'll go to the asset store. So let's go to the window and choose asset store. Yeah, in the newer version, it'll just give you a button that just takes you to the website. In the 19 version, it's kind of embedded in here. Um, if you have the, the 20 version, it'll just take you over to the website, but it, it's very similar. So let's bring in something. Let's put in like a tree. It's okay. Just give it a second. We can... You don't have to do this live, right? So that you'll, have, you'll have plenty of time to get caught up. So I'm, I typed in tree. I typed Dr. in three. Han? Yeah. Is this being recorded? This is, be I hope so. Elon, is this recorded? Oh, I hope he didn't. I think he left. Oh, of all the days to not hit the recording. I'll, I'll be happy to record this. I can re-record this and post this okay. online. 
I mean, I opened it, like, I think for a lot of people who are new to this, like, it starts you off with a tutorial, so, like, if anything, we can follow that. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of really good tutorials, and I'll post some of those online that you, that you can go through. It says the meeting is being recorded. Okay, good. Okay, so uh, we're looking for, I'm just going to put in like a demo asset in here just for fun. I, I selected, I typed in the word tree in the search box. I, I did 3D and I'm, I can click on the pricing drop down and choose free. We can also do the same thing from the, the browser. So if we just open up this and we type in Unity asset, it's, it's a lot easier, I think, to, to navigate the asset store from the browser. That's why in the newest version, they took it out and made it separate. So let's just show it there. So we'll type in tree. We want 3D things. You can also think of some stuff you could do with 2D. So I choose free. Okay, and here's some really, here's some really simple low poly trees. Let's just bring those in. That's fine for all we need. I'm gonna choose add to my assets. They're free, so it doesn't cost any money, but it's gonna want us to log in. Okay, so now we have that, we could choose open in Unity. Sometimes that'll tab over. Sometimes we can just go to back over to Unity. I'll go to the account. We'll choose my assets. In the 20, in the new version you do. And it should have the newest one on there. Did I not go all the way through? I don't think I actually fully purchased this. Let me go back. You already have it. I already have it. Is that why? Oh, that's why it didn't show up. So let's look up just free trees. So let's do a search for it. So I'll search in my assets. I've got, I've got so many. Okay, well, I don't see the one, but yours, yours will be right there. Let's just bring in, let's just bring in this palm tree. Okay, so give that a second to download. Now we're also going to want to bring in Bolt. So we can just search for Bolt. And we want this. Is there a question? Um, hmm. um, okay, so for the like landscape that you did, just like a plain uh, 3D area, how did, how did you do that? Okay, yeah, let me go back. So go oh, to game. You know what? I just figured it. Yeah, so if you go to game object, 3D and click plane, it'll make, the, it'll make it a little stage there. And then you can move it around. We can change the size. Wait, I'm confused. What are we initially working, which app we're working on? Is it under Unity Asset Store and its animations? Or what did you download? Uh, so we're in, we're in Unity right now. So there's the Asset Store for Unity. You can do it two ways. It has like a little mini browser inside of Unity that you can work with, or you can just load up the website and download the stuff from there. And then it will, you can then open it from Unity after you've downloaded it. But which app is it? Because they have like six different ones. For Bolt or for which thing? For like it, the tree? Like you what, can pick what? Out, you can pick out anything you like. I, I was just saying kind of for fun. So pick out something that oh, it looks like it lined me out. Yeah, so you could type in anything in here. You could type in like a car, for example. I want you to just kind of practice bringing in some random thing, and then you'll see it on your stage. So I'll type in car. I'll oh, put, we're downloading the, the – like the uh, – the individual like apps that you're clicking on. I thought there was like a program for Unity. Yeah, so actually, yeah. So I'm sorry, I didn't. I wasn't clear about that. This is kind of like a props catalog. These aren't complete games. Um, they're like they're props. They're like costumes and props. And you can say, I want this little tart cartoon car, 
right? And so if I click on that, some 3D artist has drawn this little 3D car. And now I can bring that little car into my world and I don't have to make it. Right. So Unity only really knows about planes and spheres and cubes and stuff. It only knows about geometry. And so we want something interesting like a tree or a racetrack or a lake or something. We can find those pre-built art on the asset store and then we import it. We add it to the assets and then we import it. And then that we can then drag that car. Something used to be called clip art. I don't know anyone knows what that is anymore. And you sort of drag this car into, into your world. So give me just a second and we're going to do that. So there's two things that we're going to want to import. We want to import bolt and we want to import like just like a something. So what's that? Yeah, it's, it's already imported. So we have we have a couple tabs up here that I want to show you. We have the scene tab, which is your director's view. And then we have the game tab, which is sort of the movie, you know, the, the, what you're going to see. Uh, so I just downloaded an asset. So what we can do is let's go to the show them the package manager too. So that's um, is that under window. Yeah. yeah. So we'll go to window and package manager because now on the 20 version, this is where you'll find your assets. So I know it seems like there's like three or four different ways to do this. You'll, you'll get used to it. And it's not as complicated as it seems right now. So we'll go up to this unity registry button and we can choose my assets. Now I have a lot of stuff, but you might only have a few things. And so um, you can just pick one of those. So let's see. I'm just going to pick something random. Let me see. I'll just search for it up here. Search for a tree. Okay, coconut palm tree pack. Let's see what those. Okay, that looks good. Coconut palm tree pack. So then I'm going to hit download. So this is an asset I've already added to my um, assets from the web store. Now I'm in the package manager. I found that from the window menu. And now I'm downloading this coconut palm tree pack because I want to simulate um, you know, a parrot, let's say. And so I want the parrot to have somewhere to live. Okay, so we'll give that just a second. It's almost halfway done. Yeah, yeah, this one took a while on the windows too. It's done now, but it might take some time. You know, certainly don't stress about all this Unity stuff. You know, um, if you if you want to, we'll be able to set up a lot of the Unity environments, and you can focus on the Python stuff. We would encourage you if you're you know so inclined to to build these environments. But we, you know. There's room for both in a sense. There's plenty of science to do where you don't have to make the world. We, we can make worlds and then you can run the Q learning on them, for example. But we did certainly encourage you to learn how to do both. Okay, so the download that was button is now grayed out because it's downloaded. Now you got to do one more step. You got to actually import it. So we're going to import it to this project and it'll pop up. And you want to say, do you want all of these things? You could, for example, just bring in one of them. I'll just say, yeah, bring in all of this stuff. So I'll hit import. And so now it's importing these things. And these are called prefabs. These are prefabricated objects that we can just drag and drop into our little stage. And now we have, you know, really high quality video game uh, graphics, you know, off, off, off gate. So I'm going to close out the package manager here. Just to remind you, I found that by going to window package manager. And now what I can do is over here, I have a couple more tabs. I have a project tab and there it's going to the, all the stuff that we have. Oh, sorry. Let me go back to. We have all of our stuff. And one of the things we see now under assets, we see coconut palm tree pack. And let's see, it even says it has a demo scene file. So let's see if it even has a demo scene. So if we click on the base folder, coconut palm tree pack, when, when it's this icon, when it's this icon, the unity icon, it's a scene. So we're going to double click on that. And it looks like this one has a demo scene. It says, you want to save your changes? No, I just put a plane in there. I don't need to save that. Okay, so this is some demo world that they've set up. It looks like they just put like sort of a blank background. And now here's our palm trees. And so we have our palm trees there. We can, we can move around through this environment. One of the ways, um, let me see if we do. If we hold down the right mouse button, you can then use the WADS keys to kind of you know, fly through your environment like a video game. 
And then you can use the, the right mouse button again to, to uh, turn the camera. And you can use your, your, your wheel or your laptop uh, two finger scroll and then that will zoom you in and out. Okay, so here's our little world. We can now set up, we can go and see well, what would it look like from the game. And it says, well, don't have any cameras. There's nothing rendering. So if we go back into our scene, let's do game object. And then we're gonna create a camera. And we can see that camera is just pointing there. I want the camera to point, let's zoom in and there we go, get a nice artistic shot. And now we're gonna go, we're gonna select the camera on the left and then we're gonna go to game object, align with view. And now that moved the camera. If we zoom out, we can see, it's hard to see because this one has a white background, but there's actually a white box that's showing you what the camera can see. And there's this little icon uh, gizmo here that's showing the camera. And then we get this preview of what the camera sees. So if we go over to the game tab, we get that's what the game would see. And so now we're able to put our virtual, we're gonna, we're gonna later put our virtual retina in here. And then we're gonna put our, uh, our you know, like a virtual parrot. And then we could put fruit in that tree. And then we could say, can the parrot find that fruit using its, its visual system? So those are the, the kind of experiments that we're gonna be doing with that. Um, Once you have it installed, what do you do with Unity Hub to make it go? So Unity Hub is the, the environment you use to launch Unity. So once you have Unity Hub running, you're going to create a new project with that. So let me save this one. I'll save the scene. I can save the project. And the question is about Unity Hub. So if I open that, when you just open Unity Hub, you can create a new project. So I had, before I had gone and create a new project, and then you give it a name. And then when that project opens up, it will launch a, a version of Unity. So you, yeah, sorry. So it's yeah. So make sure this thing might still be blue under installs, and then you'll just be looking at these two. So click up here on your panel and go to projects. And then you, when you start, you won't have any projects, so you're going to choose new. And then Unity Hub is then when you go back tomorrow and you say I want to open up that same project, you can then choose the project name you want. I just choose 3D and say create Exactly. Yep. OK, so that is uh, you know, sort of how we add assets, how we create that background. We added another you know, from our package manager. Let me just show you real quick. Let's go back to our package manager. We're going to put it, I'm going to type in bolt. And we're going to get this bolt here. We've already downloaded it. And then we're going to hit import. I've already done. I've already hit import, so it's loaded. Once you get import though, you have to do one more step. So I apologize that these things are, they're, they're very new tools and this is very cutting edge stuff. So there's sort of a, more steps than you might expect, but, but it's really cool. So we're gonna hit install Bolt. And now once you have Bolt set up for this project, you won't have to do this again. It'll be saved for this project. If you make a new project, you'll have to, you'll have to re-import it. Okay, so we'll give that just a second. It's gonna ask us some questions. I don't know how much time you need for your stuff, Rachel, but we'll probably just do that on Thursday because I don't want you to be rushed. Okay, so I just I just hit next. Um, now it's asking us if we want human naming or programmer naming. They're not that different. I'm going to choose programmer naming just so it'll help us uh, see the relationship between the other code. We're just going to scroll down. Don't worry about all this stuff. Just scroll down and choose next. And then we're going to scroll down again and just use, choose next, generate. That's kind of cool, right? So this is a visual programming language. So uh, I'm very much a visual thinker. And so I, and I really like how this kind of shows you a menu, smorgasbord of all the stuff that, that Unity can do. In the olden days, you would never write a computer program without flow charting at first. And this is like the flow chart is the program. And so I think it's kind of good practice in that sense. The program is also the documentation. The program is something you could print out and show to like a regular person and kind of you know, trace through them what this thing is doing. Okay, so that's done. We'll just hit close. Okay, so now we have um, our little world. Let's create a uh, something in this world. I'm in the game tab. So I'm going to go back to the scene tab so I can I can kind of move around and fly around. Remember, if I do right click and then WADS, uh, W A S D, I can move around. 
So let's put um, let's put a coconut in here. So let's go uh, create 3D object. Let's do a sphere. There's our sphere way over there. I'll drag it closer to where I am by by alternating, collecting, selecting these different arrows and moving it around. Okay, so it's hard to see against this background. So let's change the material. So there might even be some coconut materials we can use. Let's look into this um, materials folder. It says one called bark. Well, that's going to look like our tree. So let's make a new material. Let's right click and do create material. And let's name this um, coconut. Okay, now we have our new material. So we'll select that. Now we have over here on the right, we have what's called the inspector. And so these are all the properties for this object, this material object. And it has a lot of different properties. Right here, we can see this is color. And what we're going to do is we're going to change that. Let's find some kind of, should we make it so we can see it? Let's make like some blue coconut or something we can see it. What's a good visible color? Let's just make it orange so you guys can see it on, on the remotely. Okay, so that's a, that's a decent coconut color. And that's going to blend with our trees. Is it going to blend with the trees? Yeah, okay, let me, now, now I'm going to drag that material on. You can see I'm dragging it to the floor. No, I don't want the floor that color. I want the coconut that color. So now we have this sort of golden coconut kind of thing, right? Okay, so we can move that thing around. Now let's hit play. We have a play button up here. If we hit play, it's going to jump over to game mode. It'll show us the game mode. Yeah, there it goes. Sorry, I clicked it twice. And so that's where we had left our camera. And then we can see our, our coconut there. It's now casting a shadow, which is kind of cool. We don't have to make that from scratch. It's the physics engine. We'll do shadows. But it didn't, didn't do anything. It's just sort of sitting there. And coconuts don't just sit there. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a component. And we're going to add the rigid body component. And so this is the, probably the most important one. And that just means this is like a physics. This thing is going to have physics. And when we add a rigid body to that, you can see it has a mass of one. This will be in kilograms. And we can set a drag. And you can see the checkbox use gravity is checked. So now if we hit play, our coconut fell to the ground. And so there's our coconut. So we now actually have a, a decent uh, you know, physics simulation of, of coconuts and falling. And you can, you can put a little Newton there. And you can have the apple hit his head and all that fun stuff. Okay, so now let's uh, let's let's use Bolt now to add some interactivity to this to our coconut. Let's make our let's pretend like we're our, our agent is a coconut, right? So we're going to be an intelligent coconut. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to add another component. So we're going to click on our coconut. Let's rename this. I named it as uh, default sphere. Let's name this as coconut. Coconut one or whatever you want to call it. And so let's click on coconut one and then we'll go over to our inspector and let's uh, scroll down a little bit. It's not quite yet. Yeah, there we go. And then we get to the bottom of the list and we're going to add another component. And this time we're going to add a flow machine and a flow machine is what bolt is made out of. Right. So they probably should have just called the program flow machine or something. But so. Well, we're going to have state machines, a flow machine. So we're going to look today at a flow machine and we're going to click add new component. And. I have to look at that all like when I teach, right? Because I, it's not on the remote. Oh. I realized, yeah. Ah, yeah. uh, thank you for letting me know. Um. Okay, so we're gonna add. We just created a new flow machine component on our coconut. Now we need to add an, a graph. So we're gonna add actual instructions on that flow machine. So we're gonna choose new, and we're gonna name it. And so let's call it um, coconut graph. Call well, coconut graph one, and this is going to be the rules for how that coconut works. And so we're going to choose edit graph. And now what we want to do is we have a new floating tab here. We want to kind of arrange this somewhere on the panels. It's hard to get this really where you want it. Let's put this. Yeah, okay, that's okay. Okay, so then we can we can rearrange these panels a little bit, make that one a little bit smaller, make some more room for this for this graph. Okay, so when you make a new graph, a new flow machine graph, it's going to start with two things. It's going to start with a, 
a start event, and then an update event. So this one is sort of a check when it starts, and this one's a loop, you'll notice. And the way this works is we have this flow control. So every time it starts, that green arrow is gonna get activated, and it's gonna then activate the next block that it's connected to. And so we have this control flow. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually delete those two. And then let's add another one. We're gonna right click and get this menu. This menu can be a little buggy. So it's not your fault if this menu is kind of funny. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna put on, we're gonna search here. Oh, let's see, I hope it works now, yeah. So we're gonna do on key. So it'll just kind of narrow the list as you start typing. So I just started typing O-N-K-E, and now it's suggesting that the first one, it's saying on keyboard input, and then there's a little like little uh, thing down here at the bottom where it's saying what it is. It says a configurable event to handle global keyboard input. And that it's going to, the key is going to be the input received, and then it's going to have the type of input, what it's going to do. So let's click on that. So now we have a new block that says key space action down. So when the, the space button is pressed and you press when it's hit, when it's pressed down, you could also change it to when it's pressed up or something like that, or when you hold it down. But we're just going to say, when you press it down, we're going to do something, right? So what do we want to do? Let's change the velocity of our coconut. So what we're going to do is we're going to rigid velocity set. So... If I just type in R-I-G-V-E-L, it'll start to sort the list. And we're going to choose this one, rigid velocity set. Okay, and so now what we can do is to disconnect the lines, you right-click to draw them, you click and drag, and we're going to connect. So we're going to connect the flow from the green arrow of the thing that will be activated when we press the space button down, and that we're going to say set your velocity of the rigid body that we're assigned to. Now this graph is assigned to the coconut, so it's gonna do that to itself. That's why it says self there. And what we'll do is let's add a number to the Y component. We're gonna jump up. We're gonna fall up. Okay, so there we go. And so now we have on keyboard input event, space down, send the flow control over to rigid body, set your velocity to 10 in this. We can think of this as an X, Y, and Z coordinates. And so we're gonna add 10 to the, to the Y coordinate. So let's run this. So our coconut fell, and now let's see if we click into the game world and press spacebar, our coconut jumped into the air. So now you can go out and you can make a ton of money making a flappy coconut game, like Infenzia says. Um, and so now we have one button. You've create, we've created an interactive world. Now we haven't made something that you can't jump. So maybe one of the game, do you want to be able to jump while you're in the air? So we can make another little block that says, well, only do this if you're on the ground. Okay, so there we have the, the, the flow control when that keyboard is, so let's pause that, let's, un, let's stop that for a second. And now we can add in the other direction. So let's take this, put it up here and do a whole uh, control copy paste. Oops, I did it twice. Okay, so we can do uh, a different key. So let's do on key left arrow, let's set this to be five. And now let's paste one more set and we'll say when the right arrow, right arrow, well, let's make the left arrow negative, negative five, and then we'll make the right arrow plus five Okay, now let's run this. Okay, it's going to fall under gravity because it's a full simulation. Now we can still jump. And now you can notice it animates the flow. So this, it turns blue, and then you can see the little thing move across the line, and it activates the other one. Now if we press the right arrow, we can see it's going off. It's really flying away there. And if we press that, it's going to fly away, but then we can go back the other direction. Oh, but what, what I did, I forgot. I left the 10 in the middle column. So now it's, it's flying and going right. Right, so I don't want to add 10 and 5. I want that to be a 0. So let's, unpa let's, un let's pause the game. In general, you don't want to make changes during play mode. It won't save them. So you want to stop the play mode, make changes, and then, and then hit play again. It's useful for testing things, but just remember, if you make a bunch of changes, it will undo them. 
Okay, so now let's see we're on the ground and now I can I can roll this thing back and forth. Now up and I can't go in the other direction because I'm only moving in in that axis. So let's add a couple more keys here. Right, I can zoom out with the double mouse and then let's move that up a little bit. Let's make two more of these. So I'll copy all of those and bring them here. And now let's do arrow up. So we'll do up arrow when that's down, we wanna add five in the other direction here. And then scroll down for this one, we'll add it minus and for down arrow. Okay, now let's test that. Okay, so now I can scoot my, my, my coconut anywhere I want. I can go over to this oasis and then you can hit space bar and plant a tree or something. Then you become, then you plant. Our intelligence coconut? I mean, our, our intelligence coconut, that's a great question, right? Our coconut's intelligent, right? I think this would be a fun question for the, the second part of this class. They, they get all over the world. They, they, they've, they've done really well for themselves, right? There's a lot of coconuts. You think of the price of coconut water. They've added a lot of its economic incentivization to create more coconuts on the planet. Right, so there's a, a certain kind of uh, intelligent coconut. All right, so now what we can do is we'll then later add, you know, um, different kinds of rewards for this. We can add a block that says if you're near the tree or you're near the water, then you can get rewards and all kinds of things like that. Any questions so far about the, the bolt graph, the flow control? Asset store? No, okay. So what we can do is we can save this, we can save this scene. We can save our project. Now what we can do is let's let's do this a slightly different way. Just tab this over. Okay, so let's let's make another another way of, of, of doing this kind of graph so that we can kind of hold the keys down and, and we'll do it that way. Okay, so let's go click back on our coconut. We can scroll down here on our inspector. We have our, our flow machine, our macro graph. What we can do is we can make another flow machine graph. So there's our coconut graph there with those sort of Lego icons. Let's make another one. Let's see if we create, um, let, let me make it from here. There it is, bolt up top. So we'll go from bolt and then we're gonna do flow machine. Uh, and let's call this one uh, Coconut Graph 2 or something. Give them something more descriptive that you'll remember later. Okay, so now let's do this a slightly different way. Rather than getting a particular key, one of the things Unity can do is it has these sort of axes defined. And so if we go to Edit, uh, Project Settings, Input Manager, and then we open up this axes, we can see it has things like horizontal and vertical already defined, and they're defined in terms of buttons, but they're, oh, is it showing this screen? I didn't want that to show that screen. I want it still to be showing this. Okay, sorry, I got myself confused. Okay, um, so you can see here, they have names like for horizontal and vertical, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna be able to use those instead of just getting a particular key, we'll be able to get, close that out. Okay. Now, hang on, I want this screen to be different though. Want to share both screens? No, no, no. Oh, only I can see that screen. Oh, I got you. Okay, let me just do it. Because I want to look at that while we build. Try sharing both screens. Can you do that? I don't think so. No, it's, it just switches. No, let me, let me. Why, why do you want to share I just wanted to look at the slide real quick while I, while I pulled this diagram together. Okay, uh, it's fine. Okay, so over here, what we can do is we're going to choose, um, we're going to right click again, and we're going to choose uh, input get access. So these are kind of, let me see if we can find this one. Let's see.
So input dot get axis and then axis name, right? So we can do it by key, we can do it by name, we can do it by axis name. So I was saying in the beginning, I like this bolt, even if you don't, right? Fine with me if you like hate bolt, you're like, I just want to program this in C sharp. But at least this shows you, you know, what these things are capable of. So it's sort of like a menu of these, of these options. All right, so this one's input, get axis, axis name. Although I personally think this bolt stuff is really amazing. Um, okay, so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna get the access name we can put in here. Uh, so let's go up to our project settings. Let's go again, then we'll you know get whatever the name of this happens to be. You know, so in this case it's horizontal. Sorry, this doesn't want me to close that. Say again? again. Yeah, let me just do this step again. Okay, so we want to do uh, get input. So I'm just going to start typing get in. Oh, is that okay? So let's see if that's faster. So if I type in axis. Oh yeah, the good. Okay, so input get axis. Yeah, good idea. Okay, so we have our get input get input input get axis, and now here it says axis name. And you say, well, what are the names of my axes in my program? So if we don't know, we go up to edit, we go to project settings, and then over here on the left we choose input manager, and then this will probably be just like that. So you want to click the little drop down. And then we can see that these axes are named horizontal and vertical. So let's just copy that way we get it right. And so then I'll just paste that in here. Okay. And you can see it's grayed out because no one's giving this block control. So it's telling us like, I'm, I'm never going to get run because no one's ever passed me the green line, but that's okay. So we're going to, we're going to uh, keep going. So we're going to first, we're going to have, uh, we're going to also do our velocity. So let's do another rigid. This kind of helps to let it catch up before you keep typing. You have to kind of type slow for this, this system. Hopefully they fix that. Okay, so we're going to choose the second one, rigid velocity, rigid body velocity set, just like we did before. Now what we're going to do is we're going to do a new one. We're going to do fixed update and so this is just going to call every fixed uh, frame rate frame so it's just going to call this thing on a fixed schedule and what we're going to do is we're going to pass that control to the the velocity set so we want to update the velocity essentially at every frame there might be another way to, i'm sure there's lots of different ways we can do this what's that yeah, I found this way work. Hang on, we'll see in a second. Um, and again, there's lots of different ways to do these things. So we'll, we'll you know, I, I, what I'd love to do is build a little library of these bolt graphs that we can start collecting and then we can recycle them and share them. Okay, so what we're gonna do is let's see. Um, yeah, that's fine. I can just connect that for now. So let's just connect that directly and then we'll, we'll add the other piece. So I'm gonna say, um, oh, no, hang on, no, I need to make, so I need to first make this into a three vector. So this is just one direction. So it's just one number. And if you notice, it wouldn't let me plug that in. So it's saying, well, where it won't let me plug it into that, the three thing. So I like this because you get these pictorial representation. They're trying to show you the right hand rule there with the, uh, the green, the blue, and the, and the red. Okay, so first what we need to do is um, let's right click to get rid of that edge. And let's just build another unit. And we're gonna put the a create vector three. So let's do a vec three. A new vector three. No, that's not the one. Okay, hang on. They have a bunch of different ones and they all kind of have similar names. So let's see. Um, the created this one. Let's see. Yeah, so we want vector three dot set. There we go. That one will work. And then what we're going to do is, no, that's the set one. No, I'm sorry. That's not the right one either. So this is kind of the fun part. Let's see. Vector, just vector three, just this first one. Yeah. Do I want a literal? No, 
arrow because I have to flip pass in the X, Y, Z. No, because I have to be able to bring in the, the components. Um, oh, it might be um, from the vector three. This one, I think. No, that's the set. New vector three, X, Y, Z. That's the one. OK, so this is the fun part, and you get to kind of play around. But you get to see it right away. You say, well, I can't connect those blocks together, so that can't be the tool we need. So what I need is I want the horizontal. So horizontal is our X direction. So that I can connect. Those blue, a blue dot will connect to a blue dot. And then this cool shape with the, with the uh, green, the blue, and the red, that will connect to that. So now we can sort of see things snap together. This now, I don't need this anymore. Yeah, thank you. OK, so now let's, um, we haven't assigned this to our coconut yet. So we have a graph here. We're editing coconut graph two. So let's go click on our coconut object, but it's still using coconut graph one. So what we can do is let's scroll down here to this, this macro. And if we click here on this little button, we can now switch this and say, I want this coconut to use coconut graph two. Or we can make a second coconut or so on. Okay, so now we're using coconut graph two. Let's run this, let's see if it works. Now it's gonna fall really slowly and we'll see why in a minute. So we have a bug in it that sort of, the gravity part is sort of not working. It's sort of taking forever to, to, to fall. Does anybody know why? It's because we're actually constantly resetting the y velocity to zero. At every step, we're saying zero your velocity. So it's only ever getting an instantaneous pull on gravity. And then, and then we'll do this. We'll fix that in a second. But let's wait for it to land, and then we'll see if our horizontal thing works. What is your time frame for that? Um, is there a way to get that to print? Uh, it should show in the upper right corner. I think you got. I think it's probably a screen uh, a keyboard can, but command to turn that on. Okay, so I'm going to try the horizontal keys though, and my horizontal keys are working, All right? So I can hold down the horizontal key now, and I can scoot that along. If I press up and down, it's not going to do anything because we didn't assign anything to the vertical axis. Okay, so let's see if we can fix this thing about the falling. And so the way we want to do that is we want to, we're updating the velocity at every fixed update based on what's coming into the horizontal axis. But then we're putting a zero in for y. So we don't want to do that. We want to put in whatever y was before, right? Okay, so let's do, um, let's do like get velocity. So what we want to do is we want to do velocity and we want to get. Let me see, which one did I use here? Yeah, so just there's actually one get y. So let's do that. It'll actually just get the y component. Okay, so let's do get vel. Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate. I wish this search thing worked better. It's called vector three get y. There we go. So vector three dot y get is the one we want. And we'll put in that to there. And then we want to put in, well, what does this come from? Where does it come from? So let's do, we can add a unit for self. So we'll just choose self. And let's see, well, no, it doesn't want that. Uh, so this isn't the right vector three. No, it's the right vector three. You just need the rigid body get the y. Okay, so we can do a different way there. That's how I did it before, but yeah, that'll work. Okay, so let's do uh, ridge the velocity get. And we can connect that one. So this will get the velocity. Thank you, good idea. This will get the velocity. This will extract the Y component. We'll put it into the Y for the new vector. And then we'll update that every step, mixing in the horizontal to the X component. So, you know, it takes, it, it, it's not super fast to program this way, but you have your documentation. You sort of have a diagram. You can explain it to people. Okay, did it fall right away? I kind of missed it. I think it did. It didn't take a while. Oh, yeah, sorry. So it looks like it fell. Let me make this bigger.
And I like how it animates the graph so you can kind of see, you can kind of visually debug and see if your, if your logic is flowing in the right way. Yep, so there it goes, sort of falls under the, under the gravity. If you look, those palm trees are actually swaying, which is really cool. Okay, so I think we've run out of time for today. Thank you for your, for your attention. I hope you've enjoyed this introduction to Unity. Um, we certainly ran out of time. Next time, Rachel is going to show some great work that she's been doing on getting the agents to run and learn in this environment using their whiskers. And so super awesome stuff. If you have any questions, we can take them now. If not, please send them by email or Canvas. And be sure to stay tuned for the next session. And we'll talk about, our, do, do we live in a simulation? Are you inside of Unity right now? I don't know if we'll actually talk about that today, but something fun to think about. Yeah, please. Question? Sorry. Okay, perfect. So, so Rachel is saying that there's going to be some homework tonight that uh, to, to make it so that you can follow along on Thursday. There's going to be some preliminary downloads to get your basic set up tonight that will be posted online. Uh, uh, quick question also, can you post some, maybe or anyone can post some papers that are particularly about Unity and what we're trying to do or what you guys have, might think may be important? Yeah, so the best, the best place to start, uh, you can see this tab, right? No. Can you see my internet screen? Uh, no. For some reason I can't, so hang on. Give me one second. Let me do it over here. Um, sorry, what was I just gonna search for? It's like when you go into a room and then you- Oh yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so the best one is this, there's sort of a, a nice magazine article. If, if you just um, type in uh, DeepMind, Harvard, Mouse, should pop up. Uh, or no, it's, it's changing neuroscience. Which one? Oh, we'll go back. Why can't I find this? I posted it. Oh, DeepMind's one word. Here we go. AI powered rat could be a valuable tool for neuroscience. So this is the article that you want to start with. Close these darn ads. Okay, so you can see this just came out uh, April 2020. Researchers from DeepMind and Harvard are using a virtual rat to see what neural networks can teach us about biology. So this is tremendous. They have the paper that you can link in here. Here's the, here's the paper. It'll take you over to, <laughs> to this and you can get the, the PDF of it. Uh, so you can have this uh, uh, deep neuroethology of uh, virtual rodents there. And then um, this is really cool. We've been talking about sort of virtual fMRI and virtual EEG. Here they, they're not doing vision. So this is why I think it's a great opportunity for our group to, do, to, to, to bring vision algorithms to this and, and extend this research. So here they have, it's kind of learning to walk. So it didn't know how to walk. Um, and, it's, and it's learned by reinforcement to sort of move its legs. You can see it's not very uh, natural yet. Um, but what's really neat is you get to watch this. So you could do sort of essentially single unit recording. You know, once we build our unity environments, we're then gonna watch our agents and watch all of the neurons. So we're gonna build these, these neuron models, these deep learning models that are originally developed as simulations of brain cells. And we're gonna actually get to watch the synaptic strength, the, the connectivity, we'll be able to lesion this mouse's brain and, and have it run the maze again. We can have it interact. We can put in novel, novel objects in there and see if there's familiarity. We can test uh, creativity. We can test awareness. We can test self-awareness. You know, the sky's okay. kind of the limit. Um, and really to virtualize. So I'd encourage you all that have the background in this stuff to look up classic experiments from Pavlov's dog to the water maze and everything in between. And you know how do we recreate them? I think there's a lot of it, there's a lot of reason to do this. One, I think it's a, there's some, some really interesting ethical stuff we can get to in the other section. Uh, but I think there's a real sort of gaps in our 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 experimental and theoretical paradigms. Sort of the light, you know, looking for your keys under the searchlight. There's only certain things you can do with a traditional mouse model. There's only certain things you can do with a mathematical, pure mathematical, classical model. So. This allows, this allows us to kind of fill in the hole between theory and experiment. And I think that's very exciting. Any other questions about that? 
So we'll post this paper in the canvas. Uh, here you can see kind of the policies and this, this like it's almost like the spiking of all the neurons at one time. And we've just been looking at this with reservoir computing. It looks just like that. So I'd love to put some reservoirs in this mouse and see if we can teach it to, to, to run that way. Um, Dr. Hahn? Yeah. Do you think that you could post this um, recording today so that we can review it before Thursday? Yeah, unfortunately, there's a, there is sort of a, 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 a minimum amount of time that WebEx needs to process the video, but as soon as they're processed and made available, we'll post online. Okay. Yeah, I'll get it up as soon as I can. Say again? Yes, I'll get it up as soon as it's ready. Yeah, Ra Rachel Rachel uh, has also created some, some really nice introductory um, YouTube videos about how to get started in Unity, and she'll post those into the Canvas as well, so you can, you can start with those. And we'll also post some, there's a bunch of great other tutorials as well. So you'll have plenty, you'll have plenty of, of material in that. So don't stress, you know, Unity has a lot, lot to, uh, you know, to learn at once. So don't, you know, don't get stressed about it, but it's, it's a really kind of fun program. And as you saw with the coconut, it doesn't take that long to make something that wiggles around with the mouse. And, you know, who knows if you look at, you know, like what Flappy Bird was, it's not that complicated. All right. Thank you for your time today. We'll see you on Thursday. Thank you.